Thank you, as always, for taking your time to join us on the Lessons of Vietnam show, where we try to uh, give you the real story of the, of the Vietnam War and the men and women uh, who, who started it. Uh, if you see from our uh, information here at slide, as we're moving over to it, there we go. Uh, the Lessons of Vietnam show. I'm your host, Bill Dixon, Vietnam 6768. I was with the 159 Engineer Group, headquarters, headquarters company. Now, it's important for you to take these numbers down because I'm going to give them to you. And if I do good, I'll try to remind you during the show. But if you want to ask uh, a question, make a comment or whatever, uh, just dial 919-518-9773. Or even better, go on to Skype and go to Computers 2K Voice, just like you see there on the screen. Uh, Everything that's said here is, is uh, uh, not necessarily a reflection of any organization that I might be a member of, which is uh, a lot of them. So uh, it's all on me, or when I have a guest, like I have tonight, it's all on him and me. All right. So uh, we're going to start the show. It's, uh, we have a guest tonight, as I just said, and uh, George is going to be, uh, George Williams is going to be talking. But before we do that, I want to go to this next slide, which is important. We always add this to every show. If you are a veteran out there, or you know a veteran, or you yourself feel a lot of pressure, need to talk to someone, please call the Veterans Crisis Line. There's somebody there ready to talk to you. Uh, it's always good to talk to another vet. That's at 1-800-273-8255. Press 1. So it's important to do that. Uh, if you if you're a veteran, especially there's just we got to cut out this 22 uh, 22 a week. I stood uh, with the Patriot Guard uh, uh, about two weeks ago and stood for a 19 year old uh, Army guy, and it just it's just no reason whatsoever <clears throat> for it. Uh, when the United States entered the Vietnam War, they were not logistically prepared to send a fighting force thousands of miles from the U.S. to fight. These forces needed items like food, water, ammunition, medical supplies, and means to get these items where they needed to go. That was consisting of roads, trucks, ships, planes to transport these items. Vietnam roads were not exactly uh, prepared. They not exactly were not exactly full aimed uh, uh, highways. Uh, they were they were more like paths. Some of them even were paved, but they were more like paths. But these forces needed a place to sleep, means to take care of their personal hygiene. Uh, getting all these uh, needs together and sending them to the war zone and getting them distributed where they were needed almost overnight was a daunting task. We just were not prepared to thousands of miles. We didn't have the stuff there. Uh, we have joining us, as I mentioned, our special guest, George Williams, who was sent to Vietnam early on. George will tell us how the military responded to the task. Uh, George, if we get started now, where are you from? Where did you get started from? Well, I was born and raised in Plymouth, North Carolina. I ended up uh, in, at Fort Eustis, Virginia, in the Transportation Corps to, to deploy to, uh, to Vietnam. I had been already, I went through basic training at Fort Gordon. I went through infantry training at Fort Gordon. So using the intelligence of the Army, I was immediately sent to a tank corps. I stayed there for several months, and uh, when they had a, a, a big draw to go to Vietnam, the Transportation Corps, had nobody in Vietnam, so I was I was shipped over there, uh, and I spent a year and a half in 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 Vietnam. Now, what years was that? That was I went I got there in September of '65, and I left in the in December of 1966. Of course, everybody knows the big Tet Offensive was uh, the first one was 1967, and then the huge one was 1968. Okay. Uh, Plymouth, that is a suburb of, of original Washington. Little Washington. That's, no, it's that's not Little the, Washington. It's original no, Washington. we call it Little you got, Washington. You go down yeah. there and call them Little Washington, they're going to beat up yeah. on you. All right. So I'm going to turn it over to you now and let you tell about your story and, and about the transportation and so forth. So it's all yours. Okay. You can go to a slide. It's up there. Okay. Okay. Uh, at the end of 1964, there were just over 23,000 troops in Vietnam. And until 1964, only advisors and, and miscellaneous Marines as guards were stationed in Vietnam. The 11th Transportation Command consisted of 17 officers, 
trying to coordinate all the trucks and air transport and cargo from ships and a few trains which were left over from the, the uh, French deployment in, in Vietnam. Uh, on, on 8th of March, 1965, 3,500 U.S. Marines landed on the beach at Da Nang to protect the airfield, which is now operated by the U.S. Air Force. In the first five months of 1965, 55,000 troops had been introduced into Vietnam, or Vietnam. A large number of those were transportation and logistics personnel. By the end of 1966, there were 385,000 soldiers in Vietnam. Uh, in March of 65, when the deployments really started, the only U.S. Army ammunition stocks in Vietnam were those belonging to the 5th Special Forces units based in Nha Trang and the armed helicopter units based at Tonsonut. The stockage, stockage on hand was warehoused at Tonsonut, which is an old French storage site on, on the air base. The danger was that the ammo was in proximity to fuel storage napalm mixing sites, and the main air uh, base runway. It was later moved to uh, 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 warehousing and uh, uh, storage areas about five miles outside of, of Saigon. Sorry to interrupt you. You said when you got there, what, 23,000? 23,000, 23, yes, sir. To give you an example now, at Long Bend, where I was in 67, there were 55,000 men and women just at Long Bend. Yeah, kind of give you an idea just how fast. Yeah, the big buildup was was in uh, uh, sixty six, late sixty five, and through the summer of sixty five. Now there's a couple couple places where it got uh, intense with so many people coming in. Yeah, there was nothing, no no infrastructure there at, at all. All the housing and everything had to be put up like when you got there. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right, go ahead. Don't say Murray. I was a, I was a sergeant. I worked for a little. Okay. Um, I, I just a general picture of of, uh, of South Vietnam. The the little line in the middle is uh, where the the uh, that was the split between North and South. The DMZ. Yeah. Okay. The next slide, please. And you can keep on going. This was the Military Assistance Command patch, which everybody in the Saigon area wore. As they, this is the Fourth Transportation. Uh, patch, which the 11th turned into the 4th when they took over uh, the fort and so forth. Then, bless its heart, that's the transportation brass. You don't see many of those uh, out. I, they use the same brass now. At that time, it was you used the the wheel on both uh, both collars as opposed to U.S. brass as well. Okay. Uh, the southern area, or I'm sorry, the northern area is where I was station. I was at Quinan. Um, my tour was from 1965 through November 1966, which included a three-month extension. Uh, I was home for Christmas in 1966. I was flown into Quinan with the 117th Transportation Company and assigned duties as a movement specialist. Our mission was to offload troops and cargo from deep water vessels or cargo ships to the beaches to be transported to their bases via convoys. This involved crane operations for containerized and general cargo via larks and barks, and there'll be pictures of those in a minute, uh, and coordination from there with truck transportation to, the, to their bases and, and base camps and, and companies. Uh, at that time, at that point in time, we were living in shelter halves on an area that had been a garbage dump for the town of, of Queen Anne, it had been bulldozed over and covered with sand. There were very limited shower privileges, drinking water was in tanks, uh, and food was supplied in canisters. And all in all, it was basically a bivouac uh, field exercise. George, you remember, what, what was the shelter half of those out there are not the military? It's half of a tent. Think, of, think in terms of a pup tent, and it was half of a pup tent. So you, you combine you, it you, with another soldier yeah. to make a full tent, uh, but we didn't need to do that. Uh, so what did you do during the monsoon season? So I wasn't there. Wet? It rained, and it, occasionally we got out of it. it was, actually, I was very dry. I, I, was, I don't remember being rained on there uh, the whole time I was there. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, the, 
the the civilian population was was in Queen Anne was friendly and accommodating, just like any other small town. Uh, we wandered freely around the town, enjoyed the amenities of the town, and swam a lot in the bay, since we didn't have showers. Uh, the only danger that we ever encountered was a sniper, who fired down on us from the uh, small mountains overlooking the town and the bay. And as far as I recall, he never hurt anybody, and so no patrols were ever sent out to neutralize him at all. Uh, I guess having a poor shot was better than, you know, they didn't want to replace him with somebody who could shoot. Um, the, uh, the Queen, the, where's my note here? Uh, Queen Anne is 35 miles southwest of Pleiku, and just south of Pleiku, the four-day battle of the Idrang Valley was starting, and that was on the 14th of November, 65, it was taking place. And probably many of the troops that I offloaded went directly uh, to, to those areas. While I was stationed in Queen Anne, I assisted in offloading elements of the 1st Air Cav, the Big Red One, and a contingent of the South Korean Army. Next slide, please. And this is a bark, which is a large uh, amphibious craft and uh, could bring troops or cargo. The, the the bay at Queen Anne was a deep water bay, but there was no dockage, no dock facility at all. Cargo was offloaded, offloaded with cranes on the ships onto barks and larks. Next slide. And here's a bark with a lark coming off of it, which is a smaller amphibious craft. Same, same thing next. Uh, just a couple more pictures of those. You can thumb through those. It'll be fun. There's the bay that we were looking at. Uh, the all of the larks and barks came up on the sand up to the up to the dirt where it changed from sand to dirt and that's where the trucks were mostly deuce and a halfs uh that were there next there's soldiers deploying off uh that's that's what happened right they drove up to the beach and and opened and opened the, the gate and there they were that that procedure goes all the way back to world war ii if you've seen movies of uh of, of landings on the beaches in, in uh, Normandy and so forth. This is a, a contingent of the 1st Air Cavalry getting ready to be offloaded onto the beach. Um, I think that's probably a whole company right there, maybe a little more, maybe a company and a half. It was really interesting that they would come out and hit the beach as if they were a, a, a attacking the beach, but they didn't have any ammo. <laughs> so we And we were walking around among them saying, what the heck are you guys doing? Okay, and this is give you a more typical idea of what kind of, you know the, the attitude of the guys in those in those days. Okay, uh, the convoys there were a lot of trucks put to use in Vietnam to deliver troops to combat uh, troops to their bases, and of course goods and and services. Some of the convoys were really quite large. The, this is the staple of the convoy is a big deuce and a half truck. Uh, and that one in particular has a trailer on it, uh, which was a different configuration. Uh, Bill mentioned that some of the roads were not four lane. Uh, here's here's an, an idea of, and this is a fairly good road. Uh, the first truck there, the first deuce and a half has got guns on the top. It was converted to a gun truck and lead to lead the convoy. Uh, this particular vehicle was was very much like a deuce and a half, except it was a, it was primarily used in the mud and the dirt, and that was what it was for. It did not do long haul stuff like the deuce and a half. It got them from the beach and through the mud, and then it was their cargo would be transferred to um, to deuce and a half. Here's an idea of of a convoy. Some of these convoys were 200 trucks long. Uh, and of course, every truck had drivers and uh, and other auxiliary people in there. So you're literally, literally talking about hundreds of people in a convoy. Uh, here, this convoy here is all gasoline trucks, and of course, you can see again that it's it's quite long. It's easily a hundred uh, uh, gasoline trucks, and I'm sure there's there are other uh, deuce and a halfs and so on mixed in there as well. Those things were cool to drive. They were great big. They were fun. 
Okay. And there's, there's one of the guys ready to do it. And while we were in the field in Queen On, I never had fresh food for six weeks. We were always fed every day, three meals a day out of those canisters, which were delivered down there to us. Okay. Um, in October of 1966, I was sent home on emergency leave at the death of my father. Uh, it was early November when I returned. And when I returned, uh, the company I was with had been transferred to headquarters, the headquarters company of the 4th Transportation Command in the port of Saigon, which is at the southern, southern end of South Vietnam. My duffel preceded me, and I was barracked in a 20-man tent, uh, which is a lot of fun, in a tent city uh, near Tonsonute Airport. Uh, the tent city adjoined a golf course on one side and gasoline storage tanks, which were made of rubber, on the other side. Uh, we didn't even know what how much danger we were in. <laughs> if those tanks had gotten fired, it would have, it would have taken out half of Tonsonute Airport. Um, after several weeks, we were moved to the Leela Hotel, which had been converted into a military residence. You, you, I think you went too far there. There you, Tent City. Okay. Um, the time when I was in in Vietnam, uh, when I got to Saigon, there was no there was no pressure. Um, these are uh, pages from the Stars and Stripes newspaper that uh, were current at that at that time uh, it was just uh, life goes on they were there was no really no no strife in the city um uh, there was no curfew we were allowed uh, we were not allowed to wear sidearms downtown but we were advised to travel in pairs uh, many of the soldiers lived out in the city with their girlfriends uh, we were more like tourists than the army and we were actually given information books for tourists uh, explaining the customs of the thing. And the next page is another uh, insert from that same newspaper or a different different newspaper, different date. But again, it's life in the city. You see uh, the sales ladies on the corner there. Um, and uh, of course, a, a young lady riding a motor, uh, motorized bicycle with her owl's eye flowing along behind her. Okay, there's the Leela Hotel. It was, it was tough living there because they didn't have an elevator. It was, you know, we were five floors up and it was, life was, life was rough. Okay, next. The, the bottom at, at the ground floor of the hotel and ground floor was the term I was trying to think of a while ago. I was on the ground floor of, of the movement into Vietnam. The, this was a, a typical uh, barricade around the, the ground floors of the hotels and which, which worked very well. Okay. These are maps that came with the with the magazines and books that they wanted us to know how to get around Vietnam. You could take little taxis and Renaults and petted bikes and all kind of stuff, and you took the little green map with you uh, to wherever you go. There's just another map, another version of it. Uh, these were some of the magazines or some of the books that we were supplied, and um, if you want to go to the to the live, I can show you these. Uh, this was this was a, a a book. Every time anybody got off an airplane or got off of a boat in Saigon, they were given this little book to explain the culture to them. Uh, there were there were more that were available to us, and uh, most of the GIs took advantage of them. Uh, in that one, we were told how to translate money from uh, dollars into piastres, which was the currency of Vietnam. And of course, most of the guys want to know about the nightlife. So there, and there was at that point in time, like I said, there was no curfew. We could go to restaurants, nightclubs, shows, museums, even <laughs> church, whatever we wanted to do. Sure, I'm gonna go back and just ask you a question okay, real quick. Stop. You said you used American dollars. No, we we had to translate our money into piastres. Okay. Um, because we we had the later we had the MPCs the military papers. Yeah, papers. well we did we did that they got that's what they gave us. Okay. 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 Um. Now I guess next slide. Yeah, next. This is an area of the port. This is a a, 
a long view. It was the the Port of Saigon is is a fairly big place. It's not New York by any stretch of the imagination, but those are all full size uh, uh, ships there. Here's a little closer view, and you can actually uh, examine this, and you can see people working in in trucks and cars and so on. Uh, another another one just. A lot of activity around these around this port area like this. Um, until September of 1965, there was no coordinated movement control agency in South Vietnam. Uh, air transportation was managed at a local level by individual air traffic coordinating offices located at various air, uh, aerial ports. Water transport requirements were sent directly to the military sea transport service. Highway transportation transportation needs were met by local uh, supply elements. As a result of that, decentralized traffic management and transport resources were either wasted or ineffectual. And that was basically why the Transportation Corps moved in. Um, this period was char characterized by a rapid increase in combat troop strength and a tremendous influx of supplies and equipment for their support. The transportation units that arrived during May to August uh, uh, in 65 were company and detachment size uh, units, which were stationed all up and down the coast. Uh, they were occupied primarily uh, with their mission performance, uh, their daily existence and security and improvement of their uh, containment areas and so on. The 11th Transportation Battalion arrived in Saigon on 5 August. 1965 to assume control of the of the military port for the U.S. Navy. Uh, there's the slide. There is a picture of of the warehouse where our, my office was, uh, and you can tell every day was a Monday, and we were doing the best we could with what we had, which at that point in time was not much. Uh, we had a few steel desks, but mostly uh, Vietnamese gear or stuff that was left over by the French. Did you get a lot of pressure to get stuff out? Yes. Um, during the deployment of uh, of the summer there, um, th those services were initially provided by three truck companies uh, in, at Saigon and Cameron Bay and a combination of medium truck companies. Um, there's a number here. In, in early 1966, Saigon, Queen An, and Cameron Bay support commands were established. Uh, each one was given responsibility for complete logistic support within its area of operation, which included the control and operation of all the common user land transportation and port and beach facilities within the area. Uh, the Saigon area was an exception with the 4th Transportation Command retaining responsibility for the port operations under the operation, operational control of the Commanding General First Logistical Command. So the 4th Transportation Command was thereby relieved of its South Vietnam-wide transportation command mission and concentrated on the, on the Saigon port area itself. Uh, you asked me about pressure. There was, there was pressure in the whole, on the whole system, not just the Transportation Corps. Uh, the Red Ball uh, Express was established, which was a, uh, basically a trucking, a high-speed trucking company. They, they would cut the red tape to get supplies and resupplies uh, to the troops as quick as they as they could um, and and they were fast and efficient it was a good a good uh, a good move did they drive just during the day they go no they day. did night they were they did arm and convoys and so on um, also uh, US aid we were we were uh, we had to add US aid control and later on a small amount of cargo and supplies came by uh, came for civilian construction through a company called RMK BRJ, and there's there's legendary stories about that uh, uh, stories about that particular company, which would take another show to do. Um, basically, the Queen on port or the uh, Saigon port at one time was handling about a hundred ships a month, downloading them, and this the, there's. Cargo, they did everything, bringing them off the ship. There's an ambulance coming off there. Um, there's a whole yard full of Bradley uh, uh, vehicles and ambulances. And this is this picture was taken. Uh, I took this picture uh, from up on the the uh, uh, 
up on a, a trip ship looking down and you can see the truck there. George, on that, uh, on, the, on the third slide back, I uh, just don't even worry about I saw a lot of Vietnamese working there. It was a port. Uh, was it uh, a combination of Vietnamese and American soldiers yes. unloading? Yeah, it, it actually, it really was. Uh, and then most of the office personnel, other than uh, the sergeants and a few movement specialists uh, like myself, uh, it was all Vietnamese women. Um, and it, that led to a disaster later when they had to be, because uh, they were left there for the retraining and, and so on, and I, I don't know how they how the they re fare. Rich in case you can. Yeah. Uh, did you speak Vietnamese? No, I did not. Uh, I knew what dinky dow meant, and uh, and <laughs> yeah. that, but uh, yeah. other than that, not many, not much. Yeah. Uh, all these pictures again. This sometimes stuff that was going to go uh, to a different a different port area, like if it went from Saigon up to to Nha Trang or somewhere or Da Nang, um, it was lifted off the ship onto a barge. You can see the edge of a barge there, and this truck is being transported over to a barge. This is activity out on the pier, uh, you know, soldiers and... and uh, armored and, personnel carriers. Yeah, yeah that, those are the, I think those are Bradley vehicles, yeah. Not? m one thirteen. Are they? Okay. Yeah. Uh, there are Jeeps, and I, one of the pictures that I had wanted to get on this slideshow was a picture I took of a tugboat being being craned up off of the back of a troop ship, but I could not find that slide as among others it got lost. Now let me ask you this question: When I was in Vietnam, if you couldn't get something from the supply sergeant, you could go downtown and buy it off the black market. How was the? Did you have that much problem with uh, what what with light fingers disappearing material? No, the the main the main material that that uh, the Vietnamese wanted was. Uh, dunnage. They wanted the wood, uh, and they built houses and and uh, whatever with the, with the wood that had been on uh, pallets and 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 dunnage on the ships. Uh, and they were they were very efficient in picking that up. Uh, there, here's the holes we had to work out of. The, the the guy the crane operators never got a lot of uh, attention, but those guys, like I said, had to had to attach cables to gear. Lift it up through this little manhole, and and deliver it without dropping it onto the pier. It was a fairly tedious thing, and some of those guys were really good to watch them. It didn't take them long, you know, to swing it over. Uh, this is a, a, a dockside. There's bar, uh, barges and so on down the street a little bit. More ships coming in, and this one's getting ready to tie up at the dock. Um, And this is the warehouse area that get a little bit better of the warehouse area. This was later on and toward the end of 66. And uh, they, they added these, these metal docks and so forth. And uh, which made it a lot simpler to, to bring stuff in. And I want to stop here for a second. Um, I mentioned several times that I, my job was uh, a transportation or, or a movement specialist. What I had to do every, all the cargo that came in, whether it was containerized or put in a box or whatever manner it was, it had a, a number assigned to it, a 17-digit code. They called it the transportation code number, or TCN. It was 17 digits long. Uh, my job was to take a look at the container when it was lifted off the ship and utilizing the, a little manual that we had and, and the memory, I could tell where the cargo, what was in the box, where it was supposed to go, whether it was dangerous or not, and how much it weighed, because some of this stuff came in by airplane to start with, and I had been TDY to Langley Field from Fort Eustis loading some of this stuff onto to airplanes, and all of, so all, those, all of that stuff was available on this transportation code number, and there were only four or five guys in the whole port that could 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 do the transportation code numbers and get stuff out, and if we if we misread one, shortly after that there'd be a major in looking for his stuff, and uh, we had to answer to those guys. Okay, uh, here these guys are waiting for the dunnage. The ship's been unloaded, the docks cleared off, and they're waiting 
they're waiting to get dunnage and take it down to the city to do whatever they're going to do with it. This was the the staff command for the whole fourth for the whole uh, port area. The officers that was the officer corps for the for the whole area. Um, I have no idea where any of them are today. This picture was taken in 1965. <clears throat> And um, again, you know, it's more than 50 years ago. I, I don't even remember their names except for a couple of them. Uh, so this, but I, they were, the ships were coming in day and night, unloaded day and night? Yes. Because uh, y'all had a lot, a lot of stuff to unload for yes. the troops and so forth. Like I said, 100, 100 ships a month and, and uh, about, I, I guess, eight or 10 docky areas. And it, most of the time you could unload the ship in two to three days. Uh, depending on how, what, if it was containerized cargo, it would probably be done in a day. Uh, but, it, but then once it was on the dock, it had to be moved again to, to, to trucks or whatever, to where it was going to be transported out. So it was not, it was not an overnight thing. Um, in the beginning, there was, there was not overnight, uh, or night and day as you asked, but later on it became night and day as, as more and more cargo started to come through the port. Uh, this is, again, I, I mentioned earlier that m most of the office staff, secretaries, and so on were Vietnamese women, and here's a sergeant enjoying their company. Uh, a couple of, a couple of uh, our officers uh, out on the piers. The, in this particular case, they were just jawing uh, each other. Uh, the one officer in the middle there is a very handsome man, and uh, I think he got married two or three times while he was in Vietnam, so... I don't. I don't remember it all. He, anyway, I won't say his name out loud. Maybe he's watching. Maybe not. This is a picture of, of Tonsonute Air Base. Um, the the white structure at the at the right on the right hand side was a terminal area. Just below that was the uh, headquarters for the transportation command and so on, and then behind that was a tent city. I can't, I don't have a pointer to do that. And then at the, yeah, I think you might be able to see the edge of the golf course there as well. So that was, but that was uh, Tonsonute. Tonsonute Air Base now is almost in the middle of Saigon. It was on the outskirts when yeah. I was there. Yeah. I don't even know what that is. It looks like Magby headquarters. Yeah. And that is me. I was the young, at that point, I was still a young spec four. And uh, I had, for since I had a good camera, I was taking a lot of pictures of damaged cargo and so forth in the port. And on a few occasions, they send me up country to to uh, to take pictures of some kind of disaster or another. Again, all those pictures are uh, available in the uh, transportation museum at Fort in Fort Eustis, Virginia. Now, I see the I saw the logistics uh, in, insignia. The arrow and so forth. What was it? What was that? P, P something on your on your. PIO. That oh, was public okay. information officer. Okay. Yeah. The this is this was downtown downtown Saigon. This was uh, the, all, all the open area underneath where it says uh, Continental Palace was all tables and they had big ceiling fans and uh, you could go in have have a meal or a cocktail mostly cocktails. It was a very very uh, fun place uh, for. Uh, cocktail hour. Uh, later on, they had to put barricades all the way around that because bicycle bombs would drive up and and park there and blow up, and you know, so it got to be a little a little more tense. Uh, for example, the Victoria Hotel was blown up on April Fool's Day, which I thought was interesting. This I did not take that picture, but I did take the next one, and uh, or the not even that one, but stay there just a second. The, the hotels, uh, were, were, these were constructed during the French occupation, and they were mostly made of, of a compressed mud. So when a bomb went off, it didn't really blow the floors up or anything, but all the walls slid off. Um, and if anybody was hurt, it was because they were underneath where this, the mud and the sticks fell off. Is this where you were staying? No, I was across the street there, um, and... Uh, at at breakfast, oddly enough, and uh, and we heard the explosions and the reaction of the troops up in the restaurant was just not to run to the window to see what was happening, but to 
to lean over their food to protect it from dust falling out of our our particular uh, uh, roof. And again, this is like I said, this, the walls just was just fell off. Uh, it didn't take them too long. This was a a, a nighttime service. Uh, a Baptist minister and his translator uh, did did their sermons in a in a little uh, area that they had had rented there. Uh, and, but I don't know why they didn't have electricity. But nonetheless, um, I attended some of those. Uh, and our we had a chaplain too in the port, so he, and he did services whenever we wanted. Right across the river uh, from us was a, a floating restaurant called the Mycon Floating Restaurant, and it was another excellent place to eat. I believe it's still there. Uh, have, Bill would probably be able to tell you, having been back to Vietnam several times. Now, what year did they blow? blow that up that was in 60 65 was it i'm 65? sorry 66 it 60. was 66 it was in the summer of 66 uh, and it was rebuilt fairly quickly another some other pictures i took just walking around this is a telephone line man um they didn't bother with ladders and safety belts and all that stuff they just walked out on it um the next slide will show you the guy with this there he is he's he's just fixing the cable Barefooted, I guess a tightrope guys do that, uh, and that's that's how he did it. Yeah, I, it was I, I should not nightmare. He still is. What? I, I, uh, that's people working like the Asha. Yeah, the operation safe. They obviously don't have that problem over there. No, no, OSHA, there wasn't any OSHA problems. Uh, I mentioned that uh, a cocktail hour could be had uh, if you had time. Uh, this was a local beer called. Uh, 33, I think it was uh, started by uh, with uh, the French had brought it. The Vietnamese translation for it was Bami Ba, mm -hmm. and the base of it, well, other than beer, they, it was it was preserved with formaldehyde. Uh, the joke was that if you died from drinking too much of it, that was you didn't need to be embalmed. You were you were done. Uh, our my friends and I used to go to a, a, a bar fairly close to the port after work, if we had time, um, which is another uh, comment I can make. Uh, we would eat peanuts out of a bowl with chopsticks and drink the 33 beer. And when we got too tight to, to eat the peanuts, we knew it was time to go back and go to, go to home. Now, uh, back when you were there, did they uh, have the girls who would uh, get you to buy them a Saigon tea? Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So they got that early, yeah, early on. Yeah. If well, you didn't comments, do that, you were a number ten GI. Yeah. Too. Well, yeah. the comments have added another three to it. That's three, three, three bill. I don't, <laughs> I don't know why they extra three, but they've added an extra, an extra that three. That was to it. that was after my time, Bill. Yeah. I don't know. For those of you who understand, uh, the bar girls there, they couldn't drink alcohol because by the time the end, they couldn't even walk. So what they no. would do is get the uh, uh, GI or the soldier to buy them a Saigon tea. While they kept him company, and he was drinking alcohol, mm -hmm. and she was drinking this tea, and she could drink a lot of tea uh, during the night because if if this guy quit buying Saigon teas or she whatever or beers, yeah. she'd go find another guy. Yeah. I, again, the uh, most of the bars that the soldiers liked in particular were were downtown uh, and on a street called Tudo Street, which means the Street of Flowers. Uh, and it was a pretty street. The daytime it was yes. a, 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 the French architecture in, the, in Saigon was was striking. It was a it was a it was a tourist town until until we got there, and now it's a tourist town again. Um, out in the city, you know, which the local transportation was either a sicolo like this or a motorcycle, which uh, was a lot a lot easier on the driver because the pedal power. Um, the joke was there too, the safety precautions, you, you know, kind of took your life in your own hands because you were the front bumper and traffic in uh, Saigon was legendary. Uh, it, it, the circles with no lights and no nothing. You just very much like, uh, uh, parts of France and, so and on. those drivers were like kamikaze pilots. Yeah, they, they didn't, they around. didn't look, it was, it was just, like I said, you're, you were taking your life in your hands. Oddly enough, there were very, very few 
accidents. I mean, they just, they did it so much and so regularly and they were, and so organized that they didn't, they didn't run each other. But I, I can remember being pretty tense in traffic several times. Um, the, again, wandering around taking pictures, this, this kid is getting a haircut. It's the barber has a little box that he uh, hangs over his shoulder and, uh, people, he stops and gives people a haircut. That's right down the street, right on the street. And it would, I don't remember what it was. It was very, very cheap. Um, this picture I added, I think this may be the last slide or next to last slide. Um, I found this uh, picture very, very ironic in that this, the Santa Claus is, is a black sergeant. The, the, the girls are, are little Vietnamese children, and the doll is an American girl doll, uh, which is a, is a culture clash of major proportion there. You got it, uh, I, I thought it was a very interesting picture, uh, and that is, that's another one that's on display uh, in, at the museum, the Fort Eustis Museum. And there's my hat. Uh, the transportation brass for the shoulder brass uh, consisted of two different pieces. On the right-hand side, you see a little blue field with a with a crate hook in it, which was a stevedore, the stevedore tool early on. It, and I don't remember ever seeing one in the port, but I'm sure they had them. And the other side was uh, for the trucking company. The the motto underneath says Alans, which was a, a, a French phrase. Um, you can look at the hat here too if you want. That's, I can show that up, but. And there's the uh, the little blue uh, thing, and then there's the alons. Uh, that's not going to come out very good, I guess. That's it. Um, well, let me ask you something. When talk uh, to me. when I when you were in Vietnam, most people didn't even rise. There was anybody in Vietnam? There weren't many people in Vietnam. Yeah, it, it, uh, I know. When I came home in '68 uh, from Vietnam. Uh, we were basically told to take our uniforms off when we got got back to the United States because of the protesters and so forth. Uh, you you probably didn't get any of that stuff. No, I did. Uh, when I went, I mentioned going home on leave uh, when my father passed away, and uh, on the way back, I was uh, I was stuck in San Francisco uh, for eight days waiting for transportation. You know, to get over, I didn't want, they, they wouldn't let me bump the majors and the colonels that had to go on the military flights. So I was stuck there. I got to see a little bit of San Francisco, but I was I was warned immediately to to not wear military clothes. And some of the people that I met and mixed with were very very active in in uh, anti anti war movements and so on, and 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 destructive. They, I mean, they would they would throw stuff at you and spit at you and do all kind of stuff. Uh, the only giveaway for me was I had a very short haircut, but uh, baseball cap pretty much took care of that, and I was able to get around without getting any trouble. But uh, it, the activity activists had already started being busy by the time I by mm -hmm. the time I got home. Now, were, how much did you still have time in the military when you came home? Uh, yeah, I extended for three months. That was the, the extent of my tour, and, and so I got back in December, and I got out four months later. That now early out, of a, that yeah, early out was still. Well, I I served my thirty six months, but uh, I didn't see any reason to come back uh, to the U.S. for October, November, and December of 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 sixty six, and then you know and carry on over. I probably would have been deployed again anyway for that short period of time. So by extending. They uh, came back to Fort Eustis to the 105th Transportation Company, and stayed there for four months until I until I uh, got out. And I got out in Newport News. Uh, they found excess leave, and uh, my paycheck when I exited the army was eight dollars. So fortunately, I had a place to stay already and a job, so it didn't. And I stayed in Newport News for three more years. Now that uh, with the experience you had. Uh, in Vietnam, you must have been a valuable commodity for for a port or any, or any transportation. In as much as I was one of the few guys that could read a seventeen digit transportation uh, code number, yes, we we were, we were we got calls at all 
all all hours. You know, hey, what the hell is in this container? And uh, it got. And again, like I said, if we ever missed one, we you know we caught hell about it too. If we ever missed, and I I, I don't remember ever missing one, but I, I do remember people yelling and screaming sometimes about where's our stuff. But we were pretty good about it. It it worked out really well. After I left, back to the transportation core part of it, the 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 transportation commands instituted many, many changes in the methodology and strategy of it. Uh, Red Ball Express was the first attempt. They did another program right after that called Rush. And then I was already gone by the time they implemented the rest of the programs. But over the next uh, four or five years, they really fine-tuned the transportation uh, commands. Cargo was, and there was no excess anywhere. There was very little lost stuff. And stuff was delivered immediately to all areas, whether it was a base or out in in a combat situation. Um, it's been noted a lot of times too that the 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 army has more boats than the navy, and they got that cargo where it needed to go all up and down the whole coast of uh, of Vietnam and up the river up uh, into Vung Tau and all these different places. That, you know, just, it was remarkable the job that they did and it really had never been highlighted everything you hear about vietnam is a combat soldier but uh there was another whole army there moving that cargo around for the soldiers now you were in the army did you what was the marine uh materials brought in through that or was it going up around uh, cameron it, it bay? went around through cameron bay uh, most of the stuff that i handled was army again uh there was USAID stuff that came through. We worked with that as well. Yeah. But now, USAID, uh, explain a little bit about what you're talking about there. The USAID was a uh, program to help the Vietnam, the Vietnamese citizens. Mostly, that what I got through the Saigon port was was food that came through in containers and and, and boxes that was supposed to be distributed uh, to basically to the needy Vietnam people. And it went through there. I don't know what organizations were really behind it, but it was, it, I, and USAID stood for something like United States uh, Assistance to Itinerant, uh, some such. I don't remember exactly. Uh, it was a fairly good program, but it, again, was a very uh, low key. People didn't know much about it. Um, a, a number of our officers from the port uh, went, uh, went ahead and exited the military uh, in in Saigon, and um, were able to work with USAID and with the civilian uh, port authorities, and st- just stayed in Vietnam uh, after they after their military service ended. Mm-hmm. Now, did we ship rice to Vietnam? Not that I know of. The uh, there were not only were there t- were there troop ships and and transports and and cargo ships in the port. But there were also uh, Vietnamese ships that came in. I, and I say ships very loosely because they mostly were sampans. Sam, yeah. But they were fairly fairly large. You, you think of sampan, you think of a little guy with a pole out there. But these things, they were as big as yachts or bigger. Uh, some of them were really quite large. Uh, they did, uh, I think some of those transported rice quite a bit or, or other uh, uh, agricultural stuff. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, I know you have got another, you kind of retired and started another profession. Tell us just what you're, what you're, okay. what you're doing now and, and how to help uh, uh, those people who are a little gray around the edges. Okay. Well, I gravitated uh, when I got out of the Army at Fort Eustis. I, I really went through three different careers uh, and I ended up retired at, at age 67 with nothing to do, I was bored to death, and a friend, group of friends of mine got together and said, you know, what should I be doing? I'm, I'm you know, going crazy. And he said, well, you've always been helping people. I was a recruiter for a while, an executive recruiter. Uh, I was in real estate for a while, helping people find homes. And I did not want to sell cars, uh, although I'd sold a lot of other stuff. And they said, why don't you try insurance? So I got licensed to sell in life insurance, health insurance, long-term care insurance, and I was certified with uh, several companies that did uh, health care as well. 
uh, uh, evolved into senior, into into working with seniors alone. Uh, I I I rarely uh, talk to anybody less than fifty years old, and of recently I've been working primarily with, uh, or trying to work as as much as I can with with veterans. The health care of the veterans is. Uh, if they're working with the VA, it's it's really fairly fairly good now. It's been whipped into shape, and uh, the the healthcare part of it, including uh, vision, the, the VA can now get you glasses and hearing aids and and so on, as well as surgery that you need. If they if it isn't available at a hospital now, they will send you to an outpatient. The what I'm running into is, uh, you, you know, you mentioned being gray around the ears. We all know that there's an end to the story, uh, and what happens to us then? The 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 VA uh, will it, once a a veteran passes away, will provide a footstone for his for his gravesite, and three hundred dollars to for toward his expenses. If you have known anybody recently that has passed away, you know that three hundred dollars will will not even buy flowers. For a, for a for a good funeral, my job has been to supply or or propose uh, a life insurance policies for for veterans uh, that would assure them that their their family wouldn't be left with a financial burden of, of having them buried and you know, and their all of their final bills paid. Uh, it it is I work with a number of different companies. We can handle. Uh, almost any situation that a veteran finds himself in. A lot of veterans say, well, I can't get insurance. I'm too old or I've got this or that problem and or health problem and I can't do it. By working with a number of different companies, we can find something for everybody. There's there's almost no condition, that, uh, even including cancer and uh, and so on. We can we'll, we can find some kind of coverage for that person to, to again, to provide their family with a, uh, enough money to uh, to take care of their final needs. It sounds yeah. like it's almost could be called barrel insurance to a certain extent. It is. It, final it, expense is, yeah, the, that's it. Final is the key word there. The other half of that is the spouses, whether they be male or female, of the of the veterans are not privy to any sort of, of uh, expenses. They Even the VA medical part, they, uh, they can get a pension under certain conditions if they were Viet- if if their husbands were Vietnam or their spouses were Vietnam veterans, but uh, husbands and wives pass away as well. And again, uh, if a veteran's spouse passes away, he has those expenses to to pay. Somebody has has to help bury her. Uh, a recent story uh, I, that I can can. Uh, can tell you was uh, I had a young GI that that died. It was 54 years old. He'd had a a plethora of of problems from sleep apnea to diabetes uh, to just a, just a number of problems, heart condition, bones disintegrating, the whole thing. He did not have insurance, and when I met him, he said, "Yeah, we go, uh, I'm going to get it. We're going to we'll take care of it. But I don't have any money." And so on, and so he put it off, and he passed away. His his daughter started had to start a GoFundMe on Facebook, uh, and they had to their church chipped in, and of course his relatives uh, ended up paying the remainder of that bill. There's no really reason for that to happen. There's like I said, there's insurance out there available, reasonable prices for for almost any situation at all. Another, a, a, a different story, uh, a, a lady that I know, a, a veteran, uh, passed away at 70 and had already taken care of all of her bills. She was in hospice uh, when she passed away. Uh, the insurance that she had paid for all of her hospice uh, and her will, to, which also we can provide wills for, for as necessary, um, provided for the sale of her house and the distribution of her estate to her children. So she was she was well covered, and her insurance person was the first person that, that we met when she passed away. 
and he had checks for them within a couple of days, which through a, a normal life insurance policy, excluding final expense insurance, a normal life insurance policy may be contested um, and by the insurance company until they're sure that all the conditions that were met that they, that they uh, required. And, and in some cases, it can be several months before the family gets that, the money to pay the funeral home and, and other expenses. With final expense, it's a phone call away, and normally a check is there within a day or two days. Speaking Take, of phone calls, give us give us your phone number so people can know how to get in touch I with you. I can give some. you my phone number. My phone number is 919-623-7677. You can rarely get to me directly. I'm out somewhere working with somebody. Leave a message, and I will call you, and we, I will come to see you. I have licenses for North Carolina, Virginia, and South Carolina. I, can, I don't mind traveling anywhere in the state to visit with a family that has a need that I can that I can work with. I'm glad to do that. It, it's become my mission, actually. Any other question, Bill? Uh, that's it, right? That's right, right at the moment. Uh, out there, I hope you enjoyed our show and learned something about the Vietnam War. Uh, especially transportation, uh, it's hard to realize just, you know, they started with nothing. I mean, absolutely nothing. Didn't he have a place to stay, basically, when they first got there? And those tents, I can tell you, uh, those big heavy tents in 100 and some degrees, the air conditioning didn't work very well at all because <laughs> uh, the air was just as hot as, uh, hot as the tents. So uh, I hope you got some good information out of that. Our next show, by the way, will be the 26th of February, uh, same time, same same channel, uh, Nissan Communications, Worldwide Headquarters here in Raleigh. Uh, got some dates for you, uh, so you might want to get your pen and pencil ready because I got your dates here. Uh, by, I'll keep you out, guys out of trouble. Uh, 14th of February is Valentine's Day. No, you don't want to miss that because uh, Mama's not happy, nobody's happy. Uh, let's see, March 5th. I'll be speaking at Athens Drive High School, Lessons of Vietnam class. We started this class. Bob Matthews, uh, our original co uh, co-host with me, started the class probably 20, 25 years ago. It was in Wake County. And uh, so the class is still going on. March 7th is the monthly POW MIA ceremony downtown Raleigh at the Capitol uh, out there. So, uh, that's at 12 o'clock noon. If you want to get there at 1210, you've missed it all. It's been going on for 33 years where we call out the names and honor those who are still missing from North Carolina, which is 38. Also coming up right now is this thing is coming on is our Heritage of America Band, Joint Base Langley, Eustis, Virginia, but it's going to be at the Durham School of Arts. And talking about short notice, this is Friday, February 14th, Valentine. You can tell your bride that you're taking her out for a concert. It's free. Um, I'll hold that up. So right there, it's a free concert uh, by the uh, military bands. Uh, it says, featuring the world's finest active duty musicians performing inspiring patriotic compositions for audience of all ages. So there you can, even if you forget the flowers and the candy, you can take her out for um, a concert. It starts at 7 p.m. Uh, at the Durham School of Arts on Weaver in Weaver Auditorium. So that gives you an out if you forget Valentine's or even if you remember. You can take her out to dinner and take her there. Also, I go to read this letter I got uh, now. Uh, February is a Black History Month, uh, if I remember correctly. And it says, Dear friends, on behalf of North Carolina, more than 800,000 military service members, veterans, and their families, it is my honor to invite you to participate in the North Carolina African American Veterans Lineage Day Ceremony. That's a mouthful right there. North Carolina Department of Military and Veterans Affairs will conduct the second African American Veterans Lineage Day Ceremony and documentary to honor and salute living African American servicemen who broke the, who broke the, um, Marines, Air Force, and Air Army color bearers and rose above rank higher than cooks or stewards. 
These African-American veterans took the oath of enlistment uh, to service during World War II era when the armed forces stood segregated and participated in other campaigns such as Korea and Vietnam. Additionally, the North Carolina Department of, of uh, uh, Military and Veterans uh, Authority will approximately uh, recognize two African-American veterans and the United States Colored Troops for the impact of the United States Armed Forces in the state of North Carolina. During this event, the North Carolina Department of Military and Veterans Affairs will host various state and local official veteran services, and uh, the ceremony will take place at the Museum of History. That's downtown Raleigh, 5 Eaton Street, and it will take place Thursday, February 13th, 2002. I would have told you earlier, but we didn't, we didn't have the show. Uh, from 12.45 p.m. until 2 o'clock. So if you get, uh, go down and, and to the History Museum and see that and you see Larry Hall there, uh, got a couple more things coming up real quick. We've talked about the wall at Hills in, in the past. Let me give you a couple opportunities in North Carolina for the traveling wall, the three-quarter inch uh, replica. Three, not three, three quarters, not the inch, but uh, replica. It will be in Charlotte, March 19th through the 22nd at Carolina's en Energy Arena. It will be in Newburn at Lawson's Creek Park, March 26th through the 29th. It'll be there 24 hours a day. Um, so that's come, going on. Let's see, uh, Boynton, Virginia, which is just over the North Carolina line right, at Carl Lake. Uh, April 2nd through the 5th in Garner, North Carolina, right up the street from us. Uh, Garner at Lake Benson Park, April 16th through the 19th. And then from there, it's going to Grundy, Virginia, which I have no idea, but it's two and a half mile hours, two and a half hours north of Boone. So it's up in the mountains and so forth. So there's some opportunities for to see the wall scattered around. And I got, I got two more I'm going to give you real quick because I know you're getting close to bedtime for you older people. Uh, all veterans are invited on March 7th from 1400 to 1600. George, what time is 1400 for the civilians out there? Two o'clock. Two o'clock. From two o'clock to, to uh, four o'clock. Our Veterans Appreciation Event will be held at the Granville County Expo and Convention Center. That's Granville County, uh, which is right next to Wake and Durham Counties. Uh, this event is free to veterans. Please join us for a great meal, guest speaker, presentation, and a fellowship amongst our brothers and sisters. See, the big thing that catches veterans right there, it's free and it's a meal. So that always gets veterans out there. Uh, excited and so forth. And again, I've got the information about the Lake Benson Park in Garner. Uh, you would think that Lake, uh, Lake Benson would be in Benson, North Carolina, but it's not. It's there in, in Garner, uh, April 16th through the 19th. It's 24 hours a day. And I highly recommend if you're anywhere in these areas that you uh, go out and see the wall. Uh, anybody else got anything they need? Oh, by the way, if you want, huh? You gonna cut me off? Okay. Cut me off anyway. But if you want to talk to George again, his number is 919-623-7677. And if you didn't get that, that would be a good excuse to watch the show again. Because you go to www.nissan.com and you come up on that and go to On Demand at LV Show. And you can see the show all over again and get the mess, get the numbers and so forth. So good night, and I will see you the 26th of February. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.